Okay, uh, now we're going to talk about the second part of section 7.5 where we speak about uh, equivalent definitions for uh, a tree width of a graph. And this is the second time I'm recording it because it turns out that if you don't turn on audio recording, it doesn't record the audio. It's very surprising. Okay, so the first uh, concept I need to introduce is chordal graphs. So chordal graphs are a graph that have the property that in any cycle in the graph, a graph is chordal, in every cycle in the graph, there is always a chord. And this holds uh, repeatedly, right? So if you find any cycle, you can always find the vertex uh, between two non-adjacent vertices. If you want, you can think about it that every cycle is triangulated, broken into triangles. So, uh, chordal graphs are a very powerful family of graphs, and they have a lot of interesting properties, among other properties. Uh, they are perfect graphs, and there is a lot of things known about them. Among other things, you can order the vertices such that the last vertex in the ordering, if you remove it, all its neighbors are a click. And this property holds repeatedly. So this is a very, it's a, it looks like a very innocent property, but in fact it's very powerful. And one can spend quite a bit of time learning chordal graphs, which we're not going to do because it's not the, uh, the point of the graph. Okay, now we can speak about uh, the largest click in a chordal graph, right? So W of G for a, cord, uh, for a chordal graph would be just the size of its largest click, number of vertices, and, and now we can speak about chordal width. The chordal width of a graph is simply the, uh, the size of the largest, uh, sorry, I should repeat, given a graph H, the chordal width of H is the minimum uh, click size uh, of any chordal graph that contains H. Okay, so so um, so the important thing to to realize is that if we have a graph that has bounded tree width, then uh, essentially the the tree width is, is roughly equal to the uh, chordal width, right? And the way to see it is very easy. You just take the 3D composition of the graph, and you replace every bag with a click, right? You put in all the edges you can put that is still consistent with the 3D composition you have, and, and now the key observation is that if you have a cycle in the graph, which is this green cycle uh, in the graph, the key observation is that if you look on a vertex in the cycle and its two neighbors, right? Then either its two neighbors are in the same ba uh, bag as the original vertex, and then because we added all the edges, they are, there is a chord, so we are done. Uh, and otherwise, one of them must belong to, uh, you know, uh, the two one of the neighbors must belong to uh, a higher, a higher vertex. But now you can, you can kind of repeat this argument, right? So if both neighbors, uh, you know, um, right. So, so essentially, what happened is that as you climb up in the graph, I'm hand waving, right? But as you climb up in the in the in the graph, because of the cycle in the tree width, there must be a a, a bag in between that must contain two vertices that are non-adjacent in the cycle, right? Intuitively, otherwise, the, the cycle cannot be realized, right? Because, uh, you know, um, because of connectivity of the cycle. I'm hand-waving, but, um, you know, you can make it into a formal argument. So, so as such, um, you know, if you replace every bag in a tree with bait click, then the resulting graph is chordal. And clearly in this case, the, the, you know, the chordal width of the resulting graph is just going to be the size of the bag. Right? So this essentially says that two definitions are equivalent. The other direction, by the way, is slightly, requires slightly more work. So the other direction that says that if you have a 
three-quarter uh, with K, then the graph is bounded to, uh, as the same tree width. Well, this also follows from this ordering that I, I mentioned earlier, right? Essentially, uh, you take the last vertex in the ordering, you remove it, you use induction to get a tree width representation, and then you observe that essentially, um, right, the since the neighbor of the vertex are all in a clique, it must be that there is a bug that contain them, right? Um, and as such, uh, you can create a new bug from this bug that contains this new vertex and the old vertices and adjust them to it, and uh, and it's all good, right? So so immediately get that um, if you have a clique of size k in the caudal graph, then you have three with k in the resulting three with decomposition, right? Because you know you just use induction. Okay, so this is uh, the equivalence of uh, hordal width and tree width. Um, the next comp uh, uh, concept is somewhat more confusing, and it's this idea of a bramble, right? So a bramble is um, a family of connected graphs in your graph, right? So you have a family of connected subgraphs, and they need to be close by. So what do I mean by close by? Well, they need to have the property that any two uh, subgraph in the Bramble are either, sh either share a vertex or alternatively they have a, an edge going from one subgraph to the other. And, and importantly, every graph in this family must be connected. Right. Okay. And now we are going to look at the heating set of a Bramble. Right. The heating set of the Bramble uh, is the minimum number of of, uh, uh, of vertices such that they hit all the, the connected subgraph in the bumble, right? Now, intuitively, um, intuitively you cannot have, if the, bound, if the tree width uh, is bounded, you cannot have a very large bumble, right? Because somehow intuitively, all this, if the bumbles are really only connected by edges, then they somehow have to meet all in a common bag. And this common bag, those k vertices in the common bag, kind of would stab it. That's the intuition. Um, so, um, so the, the one can put the following theorem, that if the tree width is at least k, then uh, g contain a bramble of order k plus one. And again, the order of the bramble is the minimum number of vertices needed to hit all the subgraphs in the family, right? And and the intuition why this is this theorem is true is because what happened is that um, if you have a, a heating set of size k plus one, right? The minimum heating set is say k plus one for this bumble, then intuitively what you really have hidden inside this graph is a clique of size k plus one, right? And to say that, you know, just think about uh, taking those k plus one points and observing that, and, and think about, just for the sake of simplicity of exposition here, assume that all the uh, all the graphs in the Bramble, they that just have a common edge bridging them, they don't share vertices, right? Um, which, you know, is a very strong uh, assumption, but I'm just hand-waving here, so that's fine. And now just observe that you can essentially contract every a connected subgraph to a vertex, and you're going to get k plus one vertices that form a click, right? Now, the intuition is that uh, you can remove my ridiculous assumption because if there are, you know, uh, if there are two, uh, you know, if there are two uh, connected subgraphs that share a vertex, but this vertex is not in your heating set, then this vertex doesn't really help you. Right, because if it really helped you, then you would put it in the heating set, right? So the fact that the, the algorithm didn't decide to put in the K in the heating set means essentially that this vertex is not really relevant, and as such, you can treat it as this bridging edge that I was mentioning earlier. That's kind of the intuition. Again, I'm hand waving, the real proof is more complicated, and uh, you could say the book for the reference to the relevant result. Okay, so so Bramble essentially again, Bramble is this thing saying that uh, we take uh, 
a family of subgraph. They each have to touch each other. And we now look at the smallest heating set, heating all the vertices in the Prampel. And we say that the heating set has ordered K plus one if we need K plus one points to heat all the connected graphs. Which is another way of saying really that the graph hides a click of size K plus one. Okay. So, um, so that's that. Okay, so now uh, let's go back to this cleaning up the graph idea from earlier. Right, so earlier we had this uh, gas idea or, you know, a, a thief going around in the graph. So let's assume that we have the same situation. We have a graph and we have a thief or a robber if you want, a visible robber. Here the model is different, right? Here, uh, in fact, know where the robber is. Uh, the, uh, I'm going to try and uh, catch the, the robber using guards or cops. And the name of the game is that at any point in time I'm allowed to lift one cop and move them from the card vertex to another. But the important thing is that during this time that the cop is travel traveling from one vertex to another, the robber is allowed to travel on the edges of the graph as long as uh, it doesn't go through vertices that have cops on them in infinite speed, right? So the, the robber can just uh, move uh, uh, amazingly quickly until the, you know, of course, the, the cop lands and then we continue. Now, in the visible robber model, the cops know where the robber is, right? So uh, the robber cannot escape. So the key observation is that, to begin with, is that if I give you a graph that has three with K, then it's not very difficult to catch the robber using, uh, you know, K plus two guards. Or two, uh, and to this, to, to say this, just, you know, take the 3D composition of the graph, you know, root it, start from the root, put all your cops in the root, and now, um, you know, the robber must be on one of the vertices of the graph. If one of those vertices is, of course, in the root back, then we are done. We, we caught the the, uh, the robber. Otherwise, it must be in some other vertex of the graph that represents some subtree of this tree width uh, representation tree. But then it must this tree it must be restricted to one of the children of the node of the root. So we continue down to the child, the relevant child. Right. And since we are assuming here a nice 3D composition, this requires mo you know, moving one cop uh, to a new vertex or moving one cop. And in particular, um, if the tree width is k, then the, the bag has most k plus one cops, and then we need at most k plus two cops to move from one node to another. Right. And we can continue this process until we, we catch the, the rob right. We are essentially uh, you know, going down the tree to the subtree where the robber is. The robber can never escape the subtree they're in because the escape route is blocked by the current bag. So sooner or later, the cops would catch the robber and the robber would go to jail and uh, catch Corona there. So too bad for the robber. Okay, so, um, so here's the interesting thing, right? The interesting thing is that if the Bramble order is larger than k plus one, then we can we claim that you cannot catch them using k k guards, right? So look at this Bramble that has order k plus one, right? There are k plus one points that hit all the connected graph in the Bramble, and you need k plus one. You cannot do it with k, right? So, so the, the name of the game, the robber strategy, is always going to be in one of the point, those k plus one point. They're always going to stay there. And then what's going to happen is that in the worst case, you know, if, if the cops are not occupying a k of the, the point of the hitting sets, then, you know, the, uh, the robber would keep moving for one, uh, one point, um, one point of the one point of the hitting set that is free to another point of the set that is hitting set, and to remind you, it it can always do that, right? Um, so yeah, so um, 
So now assume that uh, essentially all you have k cops on the on the on the heating set, which means that there is one free vertex, and that's where the uh, you know the rubber is, right? Now all the cops can do is move one rubber from uh, their their you know the current location to the point where the rubber is. But the, the important thing is that while the cop is in the air moving from one vertex to another, the rubber can move from its current point of the set to the other one. Right. To see why it's true, you have to observe that there must be, for every heating set, there must be a set that is hit only by this point and not by other, any other heating point. And uh, so there is those two witnesses for those two points, and those two witness graphs must share an edge or a vertex. So while the cop is in the air, the rubber can safely travel um, from, you know, from one point of the heating set to the other, and then continue in this game indefinitely, right? So that means that indeed having a bramble of large order means that, um, you know, it cannot be easily caught, right? Which means that uh, bramble order and tree width are essentially the same up to some small additive term, which in fact, in mid, uh, which essentially leads to the following theorem. The theorem said that all those entities we saw are in fact equivalent, right? So the tree width of the graph is at most k, is equivalent to the uh, the caudal tree width, uh, so the caudal width of g is at most k plus one, which is equivalent that uh, to the condition that k plus one cops can catch a, a visible rubber, which is equivalent that there are no uh, brambles of uh, uh, order k plus one, or larger, of course. And, and that's it. So this is a very nice alternative way to think about uh, three-width and their properties.